Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, I want to welcome everyone to the inaugural session of Friends of the National Arboretum's new virtual series, Digging In. Um, I'm Craven Rand, uh, I'm the Executive Director of FONA. Uh, looks like we have a great turnout today. Uh, we're so pleased that you have decided to join us and we're excited to talk about the, uh, the Eagle drama at the Arboretum. Uh, you're gonna hear a little bit about their history in DC and learn a little bit about Eagle behavior today as well. Uh, we have three great expert panelists uh, that I will introduce in a moment, uh, but wanted to give a short update on FONA and the Arboretum while I have a captive audience. Um, looking at the RSVP list, it appears we have some of our longstanding supporters, but also some individuals new to FONA and the Arboretum. So I wanted to give a, just a brief intro about us today before we get started. Uh, Friends of the National Arboretum, or FONA as we're known, is the primary uh, nonprofit partner of the National Arboretum. Uh, in addition to the great space, great green space we offer at the Arboretum, uh, it is also a major center of botanical research overseen by the Agricultural Research Service and the Department of Agriculture. Uh, they do research on trees, shrubs, turf, and the development of new ornamental uh, plants. Uh, plus they have an extensive herbarium over 800,000 uh, specimens that document the wild and cultivated plant diversity. At FONA, uh, we provide the Arboretum with customary financial support, uh, thanks to many of the people that are on this call today. Uh, but we also work to promote it uh, with events, uh, programming at our Washington Youth Garden, and work in our community with uh, our DC partner schools and like-minded organizations. Uh, the Youth Garden actually has something to celebrate this year with our 50th anniversary. Uh, we're gonna start that celebration a bit later in the spring uh, with their birthday, uh, but you're, and you're gonna hear a lot about it uh, then, but uh, I want to give you a heads up that that's coming down the, uh, the pike. Um, and like everyone, we've had to deal with a lot of change over the past year. So I wanted to give you some uh, revisions on what our, our normal calendar would be. Uh, we would usually be preparing for our traditional garden fair at this point that would uh, normally take place in April. Uh, but we've decided to cancel it again this year and we're going to do a, uh, a more scaled down sale in the fall. Um, that will focus on bulbs and succulents. So keep an eye out for details, but expect it to be held in September. We also usually start planning for our annual fundraising dinner, Dinner Under the Stars, around now that would take place in June, but we've decided to push that off to the fall as well. Uh, this year's dinner will be a little different uh, than normal. Uh, we will allow attendees to spread out and stroll across the Great Meadow and enjoy some great food and drinks. So keep an eye out for that as well. As we uh, move forward into spring, I obviously want to invite all of you to come out to the Arboretum. Um, over, uh, with, with spring, over 50% of you said it was your favorite season, so I hope you're going to come out and, and join us soon. You know, come on out, enjoy the great green space, uh, the blooms of spring, and take a walk. Um, we've had very, very high visitation recently, so come out early. And remember, since the Arboretum is federal property, um, make sure to have your face covering and social distancing. That is required at the Arboretum. Um, Okay, well, I thank y'all for all listening to the uh, public service announcements that I had today, but let's move on to the more exciting events of the day. Um, I would like to introduce our three panelists that have been so gracious in joining us today and giving us uh, their time. Um, first, uh, you will hear from Sue Greeley. Uh, Sue is a field technician with the National Arboretum's Research Unit. Uh, she's been with the Arboretum 31 years and is a certified arborist and wildlife manager. Uh, she's joined us by phone today as she is hard at work at the Arboretum. Next, uh, you will hear from Dan Rausch from the DC Department of Energy and Environment. Uh, Dan is a fisheries and wildlife biologist and ornithologist for the Department of Energy and Environment. And for the past 11 years, he has been inventorying and monitoring the birds of the district and working to uh, conserve their wildlife habitats. And to wrap us up today, uh, we'll have Dr. Robin Miller from the American Eagle Fund. She's a full-time raptor educator and has been with AEF for close to three years. We're very thankful for the partnership uh, we have with AEF. Uh, they have overseen the Eagle Cam program at the National Arboretum for a number of years and is responsible for all the maintenance that is done on the cameras that uh, all of you, I'm sure, follow. Okay, before I hand it off to Sue, uh, I just want to remind everyone that the event is being recorded. Uh, and please keep yourself on mute throughout the presentation. If you have questions, um, please enter them in the chat and we'll handle those at the end. Okay, we'll get started and I will hand it off to Sue. 
All righty. Thank you, Craven. Um, as many of you know, the Eagle Pair arrived sometime in the fall of 2014. They have chosen a tulip poplar, which is sort of a misnomer since it's actually in the magnolia family. It also goes by the common name of yellow poplar or tulip tree, and that's solely based on the predominantly yellow with some orange flowers in the spring. So if you come out to visit the Arboretum, you should, we have tulip poplars throughout the grounds. You'll be able to appreciate the beautiful tulip shaped flowers in these trees. Um, once the, since the cameras and the mics and the infrared light were installed, we do an annual inspection of the tree to make sure that the tree and the electronics are working together and agreeing with each other. This year, Bartlett tree expert climbing arborists went up to do the annual inspection and they adjusted the zip ties that the, are holding the cameras into the tree. They reset the lightning protection system standoffs. And standoffs are like giant nails with a little hook that helps keep the copper lightning protection strands off the bark of the tree. So if the tree gets hit, the lightning will travel down the copper and not blow the tree up and the lightning system is grounded about 10 feet away with a very long buried um, copper rod. They, while they were up there, they inspected the health of the tree and there is some work that the Bartlett climbers will need to do after the nesting season. The infrared light and the braces, when you look at the nest, you'll see some old locust posts that are helping support the bottom of the nest. And those were installed the eagle pair second year because they were using a tripod sort of setup in the tree and one of their braces was actually an old piece of the tree and that broke off so we have braces from um, one of our vernal ponds locust braces the screws for the infrared light and the braces need to be readjusted as the tree is starting to grow over so that just indicates the tree is doing really well and there is no concern with that. And the lightning protection has aerial terminals, and as the tree has gotten bigger, the aerial terminals have been reset into the tree, so the Bartlett climbers will extend the terminals so that they will be hit instead of the tree. Um, all of this is powered by a solar array, and if you take the walk up towards the eagle's nest, you will see the solar panels leaning up against the trailer. That is a completely self-contained standalone system and was designed, built, and installed in nine days by a number of students from Alfred State College in upstate New York. They were here looking at the solar panels on the administration building, and the students thought this was a great opportunity to expand their skills and their knowledge and design and build a standalone solar system. Overnight, the IR light is run by eight deep cell um, batteries that are actually inside the trailer. So it is a completely 24 hour solar powered system. So as I said here earlier, the pair arrived October of 2014. Dan found them doing a pair bonding flight and alerted me we found the nest in December, and that first year, they fledged one eaglet. Years two, three, and four, which would be 2015, 2016, 2016, 2017, 2017, and 2018, we fledged two eaglets. The only eaglets whose status we truly know would be DC-7 on our last year, and unfortunately, DC-7 died from West Nile virus. Um, and we had that poor eaglet blood tested and we confirmed that it was a male. So we unfortunately lost for sure one eaglet. Uh, our current season is the seventh season. As we all know, seasons five and six, we had no eggs. And I will now turn it over to Dan who can explain sort of what's going on with the whole change of female status in season seven.
Hey, good morning. Good afternoon, Fona folks. Um, so right now we, um, for this season, if you haven't been watching, we had the same pair was back. Um, they call her the, the Mr. President and the First Lady. Um, they were back doing their basic routine again and everything seemed to be going just as it has for the last several years. We get several visitors come to the nest. Uh, they could be male or female. That could be some image for birds come through. Um, they usually stay for a short time and are usually escorted out by one or the other. Usually it's, it's the, um, the first lady will take them and uh, put them on, gently on their way. Um, uh, but this year we had another female showed up and uh, she stayed. Um, she quickly seemed to form some kind of bond with um, the original male. Um, they immediately started doing some nest building behaviors together, um, very coupled behaviors. There's a lot of like um, joint preening, um, vocalizations, copulation. It looked like those two had paired up and she kind of disappeared. I think the last time she was seen was on February, definitively on February 15th. And I have not seen another female um, in the vicinity of that nest since. Um, so we don't know where exactly she is. So these two have, have seemed to have bonded up. Um, they've got a, a nest cup there. Um, she's laid down there a few times, but so is she. Look, they're in almost like in the lane position. We don't have any eggs yet. Um, and the window is getting kind of close. I think the latest eggs we've had in this nest were um, uh, March 25th and March 28th, if I remember correctly. So, so that window is closing. But um, she looks to be a younger bird because if you see her, she's got this, this the, the tail is the definitive part. She's got some, some dark streaking on the head, but if you get a good look at her tail, it looks like a very immature, um, not very immature, but an immature eagle, like a uh, three and a half, four year old tail. It's got like this almost like, like it's been dipped in, you know, um, chocolate ice cream on the bottom of it. It's like Rocky Road ice cream, uh, kind of coloration instead of the stark white. So we know she's young. I did talk to um, uh, someone at, at Fish and Wildlife, the, the new permit person for the Chesapeake Bay area for eagles. And he says that the, an eagle that age, there's definitely a possibility she could lay that they've done it before. So the hopes are up to, to have chicks this year, but like it might be getting close. So we just might have to sit and wait till next year. We'll see what happens. That's just the thing with, with wildlife, you never know. But I did put together, I wanted to put the, this, Eagle necks in the context of the, um, the DC area in general. So I've got a, a small short presentation for you guys. And it also will show some of the other eagle nests that are in the really in the vicinity of this one. So let me go ahead and I'll share my screen here. So I just want to give you like a, a broad overview of bald eagles here for the district area. Ones that are kind of really close to DC and what we do and how we, we monitor them. So um, the last bald eagle nest breeding nest in the, in the National Arboretum was in 1947. So that's a big milestone that they actually had come back to the Arboretum 67 years later. Um, the first nest to return after we lost the last Arboretum nest was in 1999 over near St. Elizabeth's Hospital. If you know where that is, that's over in, in Southeast DC. And then in 2005, we had another pair set up at the Police Academy Training Center, which is off of Blue Plains Drive over there near the Blue Trains Treatment Center. And then in 2015, we finally had our nest appear at the Arboretum. So this is, uh, this nest here on the left is the Police Academy Training Center that's been there since 2005. It's a very um, well used nest. You can see the just the general size of it. And this pair is in there, that is from two years ago. And then the, the um, photo here on the right is um, from the, where the St. Elizabeth's nest was. Um, they kept losing the tree. Unfortunately, that pair kept picking a dead tree. So um, every two or three years, that tree would fall. They'd have to come back and re-nest. And what's funny about when I took that photo is um, they're not paying attention to me. There were a couple of wild turkeys that were beneath them that were displaying and making a whole lot of noise. So I, that's what um, got these eagles riled up at the time. So um, in terms of the Arboretum nest, um, that picture I have from June in 2014, this is the first time the eagle that was called Mr. President um, showed up, or at least I, I knew it was him. We have eagles come through in, um, in May and June. 
But this one, this male came through and kind of picked this one perch and he showed up there every day. I would perch in the same tree, then would venture out and come back at sunset. Um, that went all throughout all summer until in October, on October 14th in 2014, I actually saw them over um, coming off of uh, the Hickey Run outfall at the Arboretum and flying over the Anacostia River, um, which is the male and female there doing their pair bonding flights. And then there's a picture of the nest in 2015 when um, there's the, our first year with a nesting eagle on top of, at this point, I think they'd, they'd, um, they quite hadn't quite hatched by then. So the DC Arboretum nest, um, we've had a lot of highs and lows there, like uh, Sue mentioned, uh, DC-7, which we lost, but we have had chicks. We've had a lot of success there. And then this little one that's in Craig Copey's hands, who was the the DC, uh, the Eagle permit person for the Chesapeake Bay, um, uh, that was DC-4, I think, who had, um, leg had gotten caught. She tried for a long period to try to free it. It had gotten caught in the corner of one of the nest, of the nest side. And um, so we had to scramble and get some climbers up there, bring it down, make sure the, the leg was okay. The eagle was in care for a while and was x-rayed. And this is um, a picture of the eagle on its return back to the nest. So we do have some other eagle nests which have popped up pretty close to the Arboretum. And this was a new one for 2018. It's up at Beaver Dam Creek. So it's just north of uh, Kennel North Aquatic Gardens. And you see in the, that photo, there's the, the inverted V, that pyramid. You can see the eagle's head peeking right out of the top. But those nests in the back are uh, great blue herons. So this, net, this eagle had set up its, its nest in the middle of a great blue heron rookery. So I'll go out there and not only when we check this nest, we'll also uh, count the number of active great blue herons are out here. And here's one of the eagles and it's usually sentry, it's, it's sentry spot. It likes to sit over top the, um, the train tracks, um, the cellar train tracks heading up right off the Anacostia River. So that's how we know they're back at their nest because one of them is usually sitting there. This is the nest we mentioned earlier at the, um, the Police Academy Training Center. Um, like this has been a very successful nest. You can see two chicks are up there at one point. Then in 2019, we had our eagle drama this year at the Arboretum. In 2019, there were actually, instead of a new female, there were two males. One had shown up, but they called it M1. Um, had a pretty violent confrontation with the, the resident male who we thought was, was really injured and didn't show up again. And, but this eagle did not seem to pair well with the female who was there. Uh, I think her, that was Liberty. Uh, another male showed up that didn't also seem to work out very well and eventually um, the original male justice came back they they were together at the nest and then they disappeared so in 2019 we can say the nest failed nothing was there and then in 2020 um, the nest was empty but we're going to come back around to this nest a little later so we believe that um, the new nest that popped up last year this is right at Oxen Cove, which is going to be a, just a little further south of the, the police academy, but it's still right on the DC Maryland border. Um, a new nest was built here very quickly. They fledged one chick last year, and there's another female uh, was incubating back on that nest when I went and checked it yes, uh, last week. So we believe this is where that pair that was at the police academy training center has set up. So this is another nest in the district, which is great. So it seems like eagles are doing all right. Uh, and just south of this is another nest. Um, this is down at MGM. Um, and if you know where the National Harbor and the casino are, um, maybe if you've been around the DC area long enough, there was a very famous pair of eagles here before they built National Harbor. Uh, it was Martha and George. And they were just, they had a nest just where the Wilson Bridge span had come across. And we're talking, this is maybe got to be like 15, 18 years ago. This pair was in there. There was a female had come in, had really injured Martha. Um, in, the, in the time that Martha was in rehab before she was released, uh, George and this new female had paired back up again. And so this, that, this has been a, one of the historic famous DC nests was down here at the, at the National Harbor. That nest was actually part of, was, is not there anymore because it was displaced by the Harbor Center and the, the complex, but there has been, in um, 2019, a new nest pop here, a pop up here right outside the casino. 
And this is when a hard one for us to check by helicopter because it's really low. So I go down and check this one on foot. So they had chicks in 19, 2019, chicks in 2020. I went back last week to take a look at this um, and the nest was empty. And I wanted to make sure so we didn't have to bring the helicopter around to check it later on. Um, I was going to get up, try to kind of get underneath the nest and look around the other side to see if um, the nest was truly uh, not done. That way you could scratch this one off our list. But then when I get around the other side, um, it turns out that nest was empty, but they had re-nested about 100 feet behind me. Um, and I quickly heard her. You can see her, him or her, the, whichever it was, taken vocalizing at me. Um, uh, these guys are very prone to disturbance. So I didn't want to be there because this one came off very quickly. And um, I've worked with Osprey before. At the beginning of their nest, they fly off. Um, but this one didn't. So I quickly got out of its way and got down the hill and out. And this one went, just did a, a nice circle right over my head and went right back in. So this is an active nest. Um, we're not going to go back and check this one. But this is just another one in the DC area, which is doing really well. So I want to go back to the police academy nest. So when I was out doing checks, I figured it's worth going back and taking a shot and looking at this one next to Blue Plains where we didn't have any activity last year. Um, so I went on there on March 8th and there was a female incubating in here. Um, she was sitting really low. Um, she did not want to come off the nest. I came back a few days later and definitely there are two eggs on there. So the big question is who is this female? Is it possible? that um, this is the first lady who just hopped right down the river a mile and a half and immediately is on another nest. It's very possible. Um, I wasn't monitoring this one and the group that had cameras up here, they weren't on. So we don't know exactly when this female showed up, but they said it was unoccupied in January. So it is, it's possible that she paired up and is down here and is on another nest It could be on eggs. It could be the same one, but we have no idea. It could be a completely another pair who was just in the vicinity and they found a nice nest site and they're using it. But it would have been nice to have known if we were monitoring this one, if I was out there and keeping an eye on this, the, the nest from before. So what we'll be doing is, let's get this over. Uh, a lot of these we can't get to on the ground, so we survey them by helicopter. And this is the spout run nest, which is really cool. It's just up the river from, um, Sherlington, Clarendon, and you can see just right in the middle of this little guy hatched out. This is in 2019, um, flying by in a helicopter. We can see that as, as a newly hatched egg, and she had another one. So in 2018, we had 20 active nests here in the DC area, and we had a decline in 2019. 20, in 2020, of course, COVID hit. Um, the, the helicopters were needed for emergency purposes, so we couldn't use them. So we did a lot of this trying to ground track and check these nests. We couldn't get to all of them because some of these guys are out in the marsh pretty uh, far and we just can't get to them. So the big plan is to go up tomorrow and check all these nests again. Um, so we know there were at least 20 active nests in 2018. This is not every single bald eagle nest um, between Mount Vernon and Spout Run Parkway. Um, that's kind of the area we operate in. Um, there's probably some out there we just don't know about because they stay pretty hidden. And even knowing where these nests are and you're going up above them, sometimes we can't even find them because um, they're so well hidden. It depends on leaf out. Um, but it's, it's very important to track these. We want to know how well they're doing. We want to know if the, the, the bald eagle population in the district, um, the district area is sustaining themselves. But this is a really nice sample size for us to use and extrapolate this maybe across the, the greater region because we know in Maryland, um, there are, they know approximately how many breeding pairs they should have, and they only know where about half their nests are. So there's a big push to try to figure out and document where these guys are so we can want to help track them here. So it's just another idea of you're in a helicopter, how hard it is to see these guys. Um, the picture on the photo on the top, this tree is in someone's backyard. So, and it's been there for, I think this is the sixth year this nest has been here. Could you imagine walking outside and there's a bald eagle nest and you're up right above your house every day here. And this one, I think, um, is opposite the river from Mount Vernon. And it's another one, you barely get a glimpse. Um, we don't want to hover there long. We don't want to disturb them and chase them off um, the nest. So it's just a quick flyby to check them. So we definitely want to track those and find the future of our bald eagles in the district. And hopefully we'll, we can use this to determine whether 
uh, they need more help or not. And these are uh, photos I took in 2019 of the Arboretum pair, um, but they are at the south of Kingman Island. They had just escorted off uh, another adult eagle was coming through and she looks very proud of herself. Um, but they, they gave a pretty good chase, chased him down river another half mile, then circled back and sat here to make sure that eagle did not return. And um, about an hour later, they went right back to their nest site. All right. There we go. Thank you very much, Dan. Appreciate that. And uh, a lot of great pictures in there. Great to see the, the Eagles and really appreciate you putting that uh, presentation together for us. Um, and with that, I will hand it off to Dr. Robin Miller from American Eagle Foundation to talk a little bit about their, uh, their efforts. Thank you so much. And uh, hello, all of our phone friends. I want to give a quick shout out to Craven for orchestrating this and contacting us um, and getting us involved in this process. And of course, I want to thank uh, Sue and Dan for those wonderful presentations. I am an educational content specialist here at American Eagle Foundation. So I don't often get to hear all that goes into the maintenance and care of these Eagle cams both from the technology aspect to their role in monitoring local populations. So that was, it was really cool to hear both of those presentations. Uh, and I hope to share another dimension of that with you all today. Um, not just by talking about what's going on at the DC Eagle Nest, but about by sharing exactly what American Eagle Foundation does and our role in supporting FONA and uh, the other organizations that help make this possible. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. I have a short presentation about American Eagle Foundation, just kind of touching on who we are, what we do, um, before I circle back around to the ongoing drama at the nest. Uh, so of course we are a nonprofit organization. Uh, we have been in operation for over 25 years. Um, we are a 501c3 organization and our mission focuses on the conservation of bald eagles and all of birds of prey. And we focus on three mission pillars in particular, which are conservation, education, and protection. Uh, so, of course, uh, I'm here as an educator, but I want to touch on what all of those different pillars mean to us. Um, our mission statement involves educational outreach uh, through our deeply passionate commitment to conservation. And through this, we hope to reach our global community and inspire them to protect the bald eagle and all birds of prey. We are uh, driven by <laughs> board members and a wonderful network of partners and sponsors, including Dollywood. Uh, so if you've ever been down here to Pigeon Forge, Tennessee and visited the Dollywood Park, uh, you might have already seen some of the birds under our care. So in terms of our education initiatives, um, of course, we have our 24 hour live stream Bald Eagle webcams. Uh, the DC Arboretum is one of those and one of our uh, longstanding ones. We also have one in Northeast Florida. We have one in Malacca. Uh, we had one for a time in the Smoky Mountains, um, but they did renest. And <laughs> funnily enough, we do believe that they've renested to a rookery of great blue herons, um, <laughs> but we've been trying to relocate where they did disappear to. Um, and uh, we hope to branch out in the future to other nesting uh, birds of prey. Uh, we've been watching a few red-tailed hawks and black vultures that are native to this area. We offer bird of prey education tours. Uh, so we have visitors to our headquarters that can see the over 70 non-releasable birds of prey under our care. Uh, we also offer up virtual, uh, virtual classroom programs, uh, which is why I ended up here. Uh, I tend to help with the Zoom programs and school outreach uh, and education initiatives, specifically on a digital platform. 
And if you've been to Dollywood, you might have seen our Wings of America Free for Lighted Bird Show. If you have not had a chance to visit, I strongly suggest that you do. Not only is it a wonderful park, uh, but Dollywood is also home to the largest aviary of non-releasable bald eagles in the world. Uh, so we have 21 individuals, I believe, on the hill currently, um, and it's uh, quite a sight to see. And of course, we have a partnership with local Sevier County Schools, uh, which is our local school district. And we support our local community via our rehabilitation efforts. Um, so even beyond the streaming of these Eagle cans, we do educational outreach, we rehab, and we also provide housing for birds that would not be able to survive and thrive on their own in the wild. In terms of conservation initiatives, um, I've kind of touched on a few of these already. Uh, but we also have bald eagle research grants. Um, so we do wanna make sure that we support and promote research that ensures that our bald eagles continue to thrive uh, and continue to grow in number from their near extinction in the late 1900s. And we also do a lot of habitat cleanup. Um, we promote the idea of going out to your local waterways, obviously not in a way that and discourages wildlife uh, from nesting there, um, but <laughs> to keep those habitats clean, uh, to prevent exposure of young eaglets and other birds of prey to monofilament, lead particles, and other contaminants that may end up in their habitat. Um, so monofilament recycling is a big part of what we do. We've had some eagle nest cams where we've had to interfere on behalf of wild eaglets to free them from monofilament and fishing hooks that they've ingested or become entangled in. Uh, we also support lead-free hunting um, because lead is a huge threat to eagles. It just takes a lead fragment the size of a grain of rice uh, to be, for toxicity in an adult bald eagle. Uh, so you can imagine that gut piles left behind by hunters uh, that may have lead fragments in them are of risk to our bald eagles as well. Um, and of course, uh, windmill safety, uh, preventing bald eagle collisions with man-made objects um, is also a concern of ours. So in terms of our nest cams, uh, part of the driving factor behind this is education. Um, over the course of our program here, uh, we have a captive bald eagle propagation program that's helped us release over 180 bald eagles back into the wild. And while that is a beautiful thing to witness, um, it's not something that hits home as much as getting an intimate glimpse into the private lives of wild bald eagles, the way these webcams allow us to do so. And it's very important to us that we're able to construct these in a way that do not interfere with the eagles, um, do not discourage them from going with, through with their regular nesting habits. Um, as Dan mentioned and as Sue mentioned as well, they tend to return to the same nest year after year until either the nest fails, perhaps due to structural issues, um, inclement weather, uh, other factors. Um, so we want to make sure they're still able to return to these nests while also giving our lovely community a chance to watch them rear their young or um, as the case is with the DC Arboretum, watch as a, a young eagle comes in and kind of takes over the nest. <laughs> Um, so we hope to continue to grow this program uh, because we do feel it's something that helps us understand not just what's so special about birds of prey, but also understand why, why they're worth conserving by providing this opportunity to, for connection. Um, there's nothing quite like seeing a young eaglet pip and then hatch and grow under the careful care of its parents and eventually fledge at 10 to 14 weeks. Um, so even those circumstances that may be difficult to watch where the eaglets do struggle um, kind of gives us a greater appreciation for why they need our help and why it's important to conserve and protect them. Uh, so of course, none of this would be possible without our wonderful partners. Uh, so U.S. National Arboretum, FONA, um, we have sponsorships from Dollywood and Yingling. Uh, we have connections with other raptor facilities as well, uh, like Crow. Um, and City of East Lake Ohio is where we have an additional uh, eagle cam. And in the future, we hope to turn our gaze more towards uh, digital education through uh, new initiatives. Uh, like many of you, 2020 was an interesting year for us to navigate. 
And we realized the imperative partially through our Eagle cans of being able to connect with communities online and on digital platforms. And we can't, as much as we'd love to, we can't get all of you to come here to visit us in the Smoky Mountains. That's just not tenable. Uh, so we hope to bring the majesty and wonderfulness of Birds of Prey to you and classrooms across the nation. So uh, we also have some education partners um, and rehabilitation partners. Uh, and all of this just goes to show that conservation and caring for these wild birds of prey is very much a community effort. It doesn't begin with one, any one organization or any one individual. We have to all be in the conservation role together. So that was just a brief introduction to who we are here at American Eagle Foundation. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for just a moment to transition over to some cams we have here uh, and talk a little bit about uh, what's going on at the nest um, and then pause for uh, questions. I already see some great ones coming in. So does Earlier, I was hopeful because it looked like Mr. P had made an appearance or Mr. President had made an appearance at the nest, but it doesn't look like either of them are there currently. And that's not terribly uncommon. I'm having to kind of move around so I could see the camera. Um, but we do have some pairs here at uh, AEF headquarters. And this is something that you don't get to see online or in public. So we thought we would share it with you um, while talking about nesting patterns and behaviors. Uh, so this is a very unique situation that we have going on over at DC. Well, I guess I should mention what you're looking at right now. <laughs> this is one of our uh, pairs here. These are non-releasable eagles, some of whom came from a zoo in California, I believe the San Diego Zoo, in fact. Um, and they were non-releasable, but we offer them a natural nesting enclosure. <laughs> you can see the little incubation shimmy occurring. And it allows them to breed, reproduce, live out their lives as they would if they were in the wild, but also contribute to wild nesting pairs. Of course, bald eagles have recovered. Um, so we are phasing out this emphasis of our propagation program and instead focusing on other imperiled species, uh, hopefully moving into barn owl propagation in the future. Um, but we want these birds to have the best quality of life possible so that our pairs will remain together um, until uh, they are no longer with us or until it's time for them to move on to other facilities or until they decide that they no longer want to be an item. Um, whichever of those things happens. Uh, and so we've allowed them to continue cohabitating and nesting. Um, I was hoping Honor would be able to give you a glimpse of the eggs here. This is a unique situation in which we have four eggs. We're not sure about the fertility of any of them. Um, and historically, these are older pairs. Uh, so fertility is always a questionable thing. And the female only tends to be fertile for two weeks out of the year to begin with. Um, so it's always hit or miss if we successfully rear eaglets at headquarters at this stage. Um, however, it, it still presents a great educational opportunity and it ensures a great quality of life for our eagles here. Um, in terms of the situation occurring at DC, it's a bit unique uh, in that we have seen a bit of research done on incidences where there's multiple males that are cohabitating and helping a female raise their young, or even a, I think I've heard of one of a random female showing up and helping incubate the eggs of another pair, uh, and both seemed okay with that. Uh, in the case of this new visitor, we call her V5. Um, and we'll abstain from naming her until she and Mr. President successfully lay eggs. That may not happen this season. Um, Dan's already touched on a few reasons why, uh, but with our other cams, we've seldom seen first year pairs lay eggs their first year. Um, it is possible, but it's something that we've observed uh, for whatever reason, they may not lay eggs their first year, the likelihood decreases. But this is also a young eagle. So it is possible that she is fertile and she can lay eggs. Um, one of our native birds here in the Smoky Mountains, Lady Independence, uh, was still in her sub-adult plumage. Um, so that rocky 
Oh goodness. You, you compared to ice cream and I really liked it. Uh, the Rocky mountain, Rocky road, the uh, tail and the brown streaking on the head uh, was still visible on lady independence when she successfully laid eggs and reared some eaglets. Um, but youth definitely factors into it as well. Um, so once there is a, once we're sure they're for paired, um, and they certainly seem to be, uh, then we'll go through the process of naming V5 with our community. But I wanted to touch on V5 in particular because it stands for visitor five. And that means that we have seen five visitors to the nest in this season. And the last time we spotted Lady Independence was a three-way, I don't wanna use the word battle because that's a bit more dramatic, but it was certainly a three-way conflict uh, between uh, different visitors to the nest. And V5 seems to be the one who has claimed it for herself. We're not yet terming this as a bald eagle divorce. You might've heard that bald eagles tend to mate for life. And while this is true, sometimes we do see situations like this emerge. Um, so we're not using the word divorce because in this case, it doesn't seem like Mr. P uh, has kicked a TFL or the first lady out of the nest. It seems as though this new visitor has claimed it for herself and kind of driven TFL out and she was just kind of pushed away. I'm hopeful that it is her at that other nest and, uh, uh, Dan, if you're interested, I can connect you with our community liaison. They have great resources for identifying the individual features of these birds, um, including a Flickr account with very close up pictures. Uh, so we usually identify the first lady, for example, because she has a dark streak on the right side of the tail and a few lighter spots on the back near tail. Of course, plumage can vary year to year as they molt, um, but they do tend to have pretty consistent markings that help us tell them apart. Um, and our community of shatters are incredible and they have such an eye for detail that little passes under their radar. Um, so to sum up the situation, we're hopeful that whatever the case is, it turns into a successful nest. Um, and we are keeping an open mind and open heart about the situation. Some in our community are understandably very emotive about losing TFL. Um, we have no reason to believe that she is in any, in any danger or has suffered any grievous injuries. Uh, and in fact, if she's due at another nest, potentially, that's a good indication that she's doing just fine. Um, past years, they have not been fertile um, or they have not laid eggs rather. Uh, we think there's a potential that maybe TFL was just past an age of fertility but we tend to say that was more environmental concerns. So they have had a lot of visitors come through. They have had a lot of threats to the nest that might've prevented them from feeling secure enough to lay eggs. Um, and it could also be uh, availability of food or climate changes, any number of factors could have resulted in that. But what's important is that the bald eagles in the DC area continue to thrive. Uh, and that's what we're hoping to maintain. So I'll turn it back over to you, Craven, and uh, answer some questions. Great, thank you, Robin, for that. Enjoyed seeing the, the can there to the American Eagle Foundation. Appreciate your the background on on AEF and what you've seen thus far. Okay, we've got a couple of questions in the hopper here, so I will pose these, and whoever wants to answer, just jump on in. Uh, from Kathy, uh, how long does it take for an eagle or a pair to build a nest? Sure, I'll hop in for that. Um, it's usually they they'll pair up the season before, like the in that like the in October November, and once they pair bond, the building process starts. So usually they have a if it's a first pair, a, a workable nest by the end of January. This is just for this region, so it takes them a few months. Um, if you're much further south, they're going to do that earlier. And of course, if you're up north, um, that, that, that three month shift is going to be a little bit later. So that's why a, an already built nest, um, that's why you have so many visitors. There's a lot of energy and effort which goes into nest building. And so if there is an old eagle's nest, um, it's, there's a pretty good chance someone is going to try to claim it. And that's why also with the Bald, Eagle, Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, even a, um, a nest which either fails or is unoccupied still has a five-year protection period um, because that, that nesting space is, is so valuable that it will probably get, get claimed by um, a passing adult or a pair. Thank you for that, Dan. 
All right, just a reminder, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we will uh, we'll run through them here. All right, another question. Uh, do the Eagles migrate or are they resident? Robin, why don't you handle that one? Uh, so our nest cam eagles do tend to migrate. Uh, we joke that they like to head uh, north in the warmer season and then south when it, uh, the temperatures are less agreeable. Um, but it's fascinating because we tend to see these pairs return within a window of a few days each year to their nest. Um, we like to think of bald eagles too as semi-migratory. So depending on the location, food availability, and other factors, they may opt to stay within a region for the entire year, or they may opt to go off for wintering uh, locations and habitats um, where food is a bit more plentiful. Um, but with the DC Eagles, with our Northeastern Florida Eagles, uh, we tend to see them leave the nesting site each year. Um, sometimes that creates a great opportunity for osprey um, and other birds to move in, though we have not observed that on our cams. So what's, what's uh, since there's only a couple of nests in the district, we really monitor. Um, so the Arboretum nest, they do, they're, they're like semi-migratory, semi um, you know, usually or she's shown what the first lady had shown that she headed out usually. Um, she's one of the first ones usually is uh, late July, early August. And then she re what was returning back at the end of October, early November. Uh, he was gone for a shorter period. But then we have the other nest down, um, that's not far south of them down at, at Blue Plains. That pair actually winters on Haynes Point. So they don't go very far. They're going a mile and a half. They, they're up there paired, perched together every day, all winter, and are hunting from there. And then when it starts to become um, breeding season again, they leave Haynes Point, hop right across the river. So it's, it's they're, they're really, I guess semi-migratory is really a good, good term for it. So some will go further than others. Thank you. Question on uh, how long eagles live? What, what's their lifespan? Uh, so generally speaking, the rule of thumb we use is that it tends to be twice as long under human care as it is out in the wild. So uh, in under our care, they can live to be 45 to 50. Um, so the average wild lifespan is 25 to 30. And Dan, I'm, I know you have better information about wild lifespans uh, than I do. Um, so they're surprisingly long lived. It seems to be the inverse of the old saying of the larger the dog, the shorter the lifespan with birds of prey. Uh, the larger the bird of prey, the longer the lifespan. All right, there's a question here around that, uh, the situation with the first lady and the, and the, uh, the other female that, came, female that came in. Maybe talk a little bit more. It looks like the question is around, you know, how was she not able to drive out the newcomer and, and how that works in general? Sure. So actually Sue and I were out there one day uh, when um, this had to be what, three, four years ago, Sue, there was a, a, a younger eagle in the nest with him. And we were, weren't very far from the nest site. We were just outside by the observation post and we saw her coming in at full speed with talons out. It was really a sight to see. Um, just the velocity she comes in at and chases them off. So that seems to be, you know, just uh, a method of, of, of scooting one, the other ones along and showing that you really mean business. So we, we have seen her multiple times um, chase them out and even he, uh, he has as well. Um, but just seeing that the effort this time either didn't work because the, um, she didn't have an inner to do it. Or maybe she, it was just a, maybe a half-hearted attempt or this one just really was determined to, to stick in there. So um, it, in this, the situation is a little different, but she had been really successful every other time about chasing a visitor out. Okay. I like this question. Are drones an option uh, to helicopter for monitoring nest, recognizing the drones could be attacked by eagles? Uh, that is a great question. And I would love to be able to use drones to do it. Um, uh, we are, very close to uh, DCA National Airport. Um, it's a we're in a restricted zone. We've tried a couple of times to get exemptions to use them for scientific purposes, um, but just the nature of the District of Columbia with so many military installations um, and sensitive targets, um, drones really are at this point are not an option. We're working on that, um, but yeah, it would it would it would be helpful in doing a lot of these nest checks, but we just can't do it right now. 
Okay. And one more question. Uh, what is the best diet for DC Eagles and are there worries about what they eat? Uh, to my knowledge, we're pretty confident in the biodiversity of the diet options that these birds have. So we've seen them bring uh, a diverse amount of fish, even some gar and some American eels, I believe, are in the local waterways. Um, and it's a fairly protected area. Uh, there's always the concern. I'm not sure if there's any fishing areas. I like the kind of local knowledge. So feel free to ch chime in. Um, but uh, monofilament uh, would only be a concern in areas where there's an abundance of fishing. Yeah, we've had a, there's been a, wasn't there a hook in one of the fish they brought at one point, which is, you know, a little bit of a problem. Um, just some of the stuff they bring back into the nest is an issue. But so far, unless we went up and did testing on egg fragments or an egg maybe that didn't hatch, and we'd have to do that for contaminants would, would be an indicator. But we do do a lot of water quality work on the Anacostia River, which is the main source of, of food for these guys. Um, Cause they have, they seem to have a very set um, territory area when it comes to uh, gathering food with the nest to the North and South of them now. Um, but that our testing is done all the time. Uh, we're monitoring for contaminants and PCBs, um, but it's so far, everything seems to be within the realm, um, but we'll continue to monitor that. A follow-up question there. So, is it all fish? Is that is that their diet consist wholly of fish? No. What was uh, we seen some ducks in there? We seen some gull wings. Uh, what was really cool was I think it was in 2017 we had a very uh, wet March, um, really really heavy rainfall. There was a lot of turbidity in the water, and it was really hard for these eagles to fish. Um, so it was Mr. President started actually hunting groundhogs, and it was very much a learning experience. Um, it took him a while to catch the first one and then the less time for the next. And um, they got really good at catching groundhogs, much to the, uh, I think the Arboretum was very happy about that. But they did a lot of hunting in that field right next to where the, where the columns are. And then back behind the grove of straight trees, you could actually see them uh, pick up groundhogs a few times. So they adapt. Um, that This is over the time, um, the original pair seemed to be a very compatible couple when it came to providing. There was, there was never an issue of a lack of food. We like to say that they're opportunistic. Um, so typically we say their diet is uh, predominantly fish, but they'll eat just about anything they can get their talons on. So we've had a few phone calls here at American Eagle Foundation of injured, injured bald eagles on the side of the road. And then we had to inform the concerned Good Samaritan that those eagles are just dining on carry-on. <laughs> um, so they can be scavengers, they can adapt, uh, they'll adjust their hunting style to whatever prey is available. Um, and so small like waterfowl is definitely on the dinner menu for them. Uh, typically large rodents uh, due to their size and agility, they may have a harder time catching smaller prey. Uh, but we often attribute the sexual dimorphism uh, observed between the female being larger and the male being smaller to help diversify the food they're able to catch as a pair. I assume our small dogs are safe, though. <laughs> I would be surprised. Um, it's not saying that an inexperienced bald eagle may not attempt on a very, very small dog. Um, that's generally a prey item that uh, most birds have the good sense of knowing uh, will fight back. I will say that raptors tend to get a bad rep for that um, over other more likely suspects like coyotes. Um, so generally speaking, if a small animal goes missing, um, it's not a bird of prey. They can't really carry a uh, whole much, a whole lot. Uh, they generally only carry a fraction of their body weight. Um, so considering the size of these more uh, Southern, I know that's a strange thing to say, bald eagles, um, your 10 pound dog is safe. <laughs> All right, our last question. Uh, Anita Windsor wants to know, does anybody know what happened to Martha? I want to make sure we know if we, if we have any knowledge on Martha, we can talk about that. I don't. I would have to look that up because she did come back from rehab for release. But, um, I, you know, that was a long, long time ago. And I don't even, you know, that's not in my head until I was actually at that nest. And I remembered this is where George and Martha were. Um, but I can, I can look that up for you. Okay. Well, thank you. This has been fantastic. I, I give a big, big thank you to 
to Sue, Robin, and Dan for taking their time to share their knowledge on Eagles today. Um, really appreciate everyone, uh, everyone's participation. We had a great group today. I think we had over 60 people, which is just fantastic. Um, if you're interested in learning more about, uh, about FONA, um, uh, you can go to our, our newly designed website at FONA.org. Uh, I would encourage everyone to sign up for our FONA Field Notes, uh, which is our weekly newsletter. Uh, you can see the, uh, the link there, but you can also sign up through our website. And uh, keep an eye out. We're gonna again. This is our first digging in event. Um, and if you have any ideas around uh, future subjects, send those along to us. We'll we'll, we'll take those into uh, into account, and uh, we'll keep you informed. But again, thank you to everyone. I just I, I enjoyed this day. I learned a lot. The whole the groundhog thing. I, I, I'm gonna have to share that with some other people. Um, but again, many thanks to Dan, uh, to Robin, and to Sue for their time, and thanks to all of you for for participating. And I hope that you will come back and uh, dig in with us sometime in the future. So thank you, and hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.